Pippa Fun or Take the Reins is definitely a game of two halves. The first being a tolerable three-day event simulator with the usual dot following, hit space when you're in the green-ing, and seamlessly endless hoof picking. The second is a whirlwind of a story that leaps from beat to beat without stopping to think, wait, does this make any sense? The result is a game that is narratively confusing, but definitely stands out as a horse game where something actually happens. A rare occurrence indeed. As discussed in my first video about the Stud Farm Inheritance, you should watch it. Lexus Numerique was in the business of making puzzle games for children, and the Alexandra Letterman series was their current baby. I go into more detail about the history of the company and the development of that series in that video, so you should check it out if you're just gasping for more horse content. Depending on where you live, these games will have different titles and are affiliated with different people. I'll be using the UK name, Pippa Funnel Take the Reins, and the footage I'll be using for this video comes from my playthrough of the US release, Champion Dreams First to Ride. Now the title makes any sense given the context of the game. The French title translates as School of Champions, which is what the game is about, so we have the rare occurrence of the French actually getting something right. Set at the Sycamore Riding Academy, Take the Reins brings us to Scotland, the United States, and Morocco to hone our riding skills, learn the power of friendship, and a secret third thing to complete our rule of threes. I don't know. Released only a year later in 2005, we have a huge step up in quality in regards to graphics and animation compared to the previous game. Motion capture was used for the horse and rider movements, so they are much more fluid and realistic. We're no longer treated to the beautiful rising canter that we had in the game before. That being said, the game is still riddled with jank, from clipping to missing textures and subtitles that are just completely different from what the voice actors are saying. I'm willing to bet some of this is from how I obtained this particular copy of the game, but even as a kid I remember the disco boots and characters cutting each other off mid-sentence, except for when they're supposed to actually interrupt each other and then there's just an awkward silence. I'm so sorry, I really regret- Were you the one in my horse box the other day? And there is of course the staple of every Lexus Numerique games, the absolutely terrifying creatures they want us to sit on. These horses are different from the models used in the previous two games, so clearly they had work to try and improve them, but they seem to have doubled down on the scary and created sinewy beasts with a demonic energy most foul. The character models and the environments especially are really well thought out and stylistically they all fit together, so the horses really stand out as alien and other by comparison. There is some kind of irony of having a game series focused around a specific animal and your relationship to it, especially one that is known for being beautiful and majestic, but then making that animal just horrifying and impossible to feel any affection towards. Imagine if we'd gotten photo-skinned Nintendogs if you dare. Looking at the game's website using the Wayback Machine, you can see that Alexandra Lederman was very involved in the marketing of this game and the community that had formed around them. Unfortunately, these videos haven't been archived, but supposedly Lederman was sharing weekly videos about the game's development and answering fan questions about what they might expect. There were also some polls and questionnaires on the website, asking fans what they thought about the game and what their favourite elements were. I think it's really interesting that they were doing this kind of market research within the community, especially since it asks players' opinions on known friction points, such as the horse models, stall cleaning, character design. I couldn't find any press releases from Pippa Funnel about this game or the rest of the series after the Stud Farm Inheritance. She is a character in this game and not just a disembodied voice like the other one, so she was involved in some way, but they literally spell her name wrong in the credits, so I don't blame her for paying them dust. Most of the voice actors are the same from the previous game, with the voice actor for Rose now playing our lead character, Jade. We'll talk more about the voice actors and the uh, choices that were made when we get to know our characters a bit later on. Okay, context provided. Into the darkness we go. Walk on. <laughs> the game opens on a dark and stormy night with Jade, a young woman of indeterminate age, on her way to a school in Scotland. Hmm, I wonder what inspired this cutscene. I guess we'll never know. Upon arrival, we are greeted by Harry, who was 
lurking on all fours in the woods for some reason, and he chides us for being late and over needing our dough. As we enter the school grounds, a bolt of lightning strikes a stable and starts a PNG fire, the most deadly kind. Harry runs to get help and tells us to stay put, and Jade obliges by staring blankly into the void. This intro sequence is illustrative of the game's energy as a whole and really lets us know what we're in for. The action begins immediately as if saying to the player, oh, you thought the first game was boring? You want us to set a horse on fire? Is that what you're asking for? Kid, if you insist, we'll set a horse on fire. We will burn a horse alive for you if that's what you want. In about three minutes, we get four different pieces of music, all at different volumes, and all of which completely drown out the dialogue. And the voice actors sound like this is their first time using words to convey information and emotion. The horse box is on fire. Is there a horse inside? It's great. I love it. When Jade comes to, a voice in her head explains the basic process of moving your body using the arrow keys. This voice, named Elsis, Elise, spelt wrong, pops up a few times during the game to offer exposition. And Jade outright says that it sounds like a voice talking to her that she's never heard before. It's an interesting addition when they could have just made this her internal dialogue, but instead they decided to give their protagonist sudden onset auditory hallucinations. Skipping forwards a bit, there is a cutscene titled Elsie's, where Jade appears to go towards the light after passing out. So I'm going to be charitable and assume she was supposed to hear this voice after she faints and that that would make more sense. Jade runs over to the stable and enters the burning barn a la Black Beauty. We find the key to the stable and open the door. We get another cutscene of Jade desperately trying to open the stall. We literally just found the key. Why is it hard to open? And finally we free the horse inside. It looks us dead in the eye and then leaves us to die in a fire. <laughs> Thanks bro. <laughs> This is where we go towards the light to meet our divine creator, Father God, and then we are rudely awakened by a man whistling in the bedroom of an unconscious woman. Good start. Remember when we were really obsessed with manspreading and used it to kind of symbolize how men are inconsiderate to those around them? That's me with whistling. I hate whistling. I also cannot whistle, um, but that's besides the point. We find out that the man whistling is Esteban, and he tells us that nobody was injured in the fire, we literally passed out from smoke inhalation, and that the horse was okay. He tells us that the horse we saved is the most stubborn and difficult stallion at the academy, but he's also the most talented. Esteban says that he was supposed to ride the horse, but as a reward for our bravery, the horse is being given to us instead. Esteban is Spanish, if you couldn't already tell by his shirt being unbuttoned down to his belly button. And the game plays this telenovela style music to really drive the point home. The voice actor playing Esteban is actually Hispanic, and according to his agency website, a bona fide triple threat actor thespian mime superstar. So his performance is one of the better ones. The stallion in question is the horse that we picked right at the very beginning of the game. My biggest gripe with this when I was a kid is that nowhere on the screen does it say that this horse is going to be a stallion. So your precious RP is ruined if you make a mare in your head and then she's predetermined to be a he. Esteban takes us downstairs to meet the rest of the students at the academy, Ginger, Q and Spike. We briefly meet the director of the academy and we get our cameos from whichever rider was affiliated with the game in your country. In the US version, Pippa Funnel is renamed Sally because expecting Americans to know a non-American is actually a violation of their civil liberties. As we are now students at a prestigious riding academy, which is apparently a real thing, we're going to have to organize our activities within a timetable. I think it's cute that the other students have the timetables on their computer too, except for Spike who's playing Rayman, a magical limbless being renowned for his courage and determination. At this point I realise that the game doesn't actually tell you the name of the school or like the premise of the game. My understanding is that we compete as a team against other schools, but the game only shows us competing against each other. I don't know. There are also students listed in these competitions that we never see, 
Most notable is the esteemed Gerald Tiger, who gets eliminated in every event, but keeps travelling the world with us. Every day we need to choose four activities and balance the needs of our horse, ourselves and our riding skills. At the end of the week we will be judged on what scores we achieved and take part in a riding competition. You can also take your horse on walks, where we ride around a trail and take pictures to send back to our family. My favourite is when we're in the US and we get asked to take a picture of the saddest basketball court you've ever seen and a police car. The students in this game are really something else and I'll hazard a guess that their stories didn't make sense in the French version of the game either, pre-translation. Still, maybe it's nostalgia talking, but I find them oddly compelling, even though every interaction basically goes like this. So you remember when I said that my entire family was killed when a hot air balloon crashed into our cottage on Martha's Vineyard? It turns out that the horse that was flying the hot air balloon belonged to my grandmother. He was a beautiful stallion with a golden mane. And just the day before, my grandmother had given me a locket and told me to only open it after she died. I never could have guessed what was inside that locket and how it would change my life for- Wow, what was inside the locket? I don't want to talk about it anymore. And scene. <laughs> we'll talk more about each character's specific flavour of trauma when they crop up in the story, so for now let's talk about the riding and grooming mechanics. The horse riding parts of this game are pretty similar to the other games, but with much nicer animation and graphics. The biggest change is the addition of your horse's morale bar. For jumping, ideally you need to press the space bar when the line is either in the green or the red section of this bar. If you jump when the line is in the blue, your horse will knock down a pole or refuse, even if you're still in the green stripe on the ground. The lower your horse's morale, the larger the blue area becomes, making the timing a bit more difficult. Grooming your horse a few times a week will make sure that morale stays high, or low I guess, because you want the bar to be lower. The game says that jumping when the line is in the heart section can save a jump that otherwise would knock a pole down because you're in perfect harmony, but I don't think I actually saw that happen during my entire playthrough. It just makes a little plinky noise. I get them wanting to add new elements to keep the gameplay fresh, but it just feels kind of arbitrary. Morale also affects dressage, as you now need to periodically control your horse throughout the test using the control button on the keyboard. Mm. Missing the control points will lower your horse's morale because he likes it when you're in control. We get some nice dressage animations and some not so nice. The pirouette animations are especially pretty and I really like the juxtaposition of the scary dragon horse with front facing eyes doing the most realistic horse animation I've ever seen in a video game. The biggest downgrade to the riding is the fact that they managed to make the stamina even worse. It's not uncommon for you to just have to walk or stop halfway through a cross-country course to regain some stamina. It sucks. Nothing will ever compare to how fun cross-country is in the Lucinda Green's Equestrian Challenge game. I'm not sure the one person that disliked that video. Who sees a video with three likes and decides to dislike it? Which one of you did that? <laughs> the grooming mini-games are, again, very similar to the previous two games, but somehow they managed to make the stall cleaning even more annoying. What makes the horse care tolerable is the fact that there is a absolute tune playing in the background. The composer for this game, Mike Pummel, did a stellar job making the soundtrack. If you ever see this, Michael, please know that I recognise the hard work that you put into this game and I am very grateful that you took it seriously because these songs are beautiful. I'm going to try and include snippets of these songs in this video um, but if they're missing, just assume it was because Ubisoft tried to put me in YouTube jail. The only negative part of the sound design is the fact that the game doesn't seem to understand that changing the sliders in the options menu should, I don't know, impact the level of volume in the game. It feels passive aggressive at a certain point when you can set the sound effects 
volume two, three, and it's absolutely deafening. And then you change it to two and you can't hear a single thing. <laughs> I had the music set to one and the dialogue set to 10. And this is what the entire game sounded like. I'll write again soon, your loving sister. Adding the fact that lines of dialogue will just cut out halfway or that characters are constantly interrupting themselves, it really makes the game feel frenetic and chaotic and overstimulating. <laughs> the first two days of our timetable are planned out for us and then we're on our own. After playing through a few activities, we find ourselves at a birthday party for the lovely Ginger. Everyone is busting a move and getting their respective freak on, but Esteban pulls us aside to say that he's forgotten Ginger's present. He's hidden it in the attic and he wants us to sneak out and bring it back, but we have to be careful because the teachers are patrolling the hallways. The story parts of this game are interspersed within the timetable, but they don't tell you when they're going to happen. I get that this is trying to make it feel spontaneous, but instead you just lose that slot in your timetable. And if you were relying on it to keep your grades up, then you can get screwed over. We get a cute little sneaking puzzle where we need to figure out how to distract Harry and the director so we can get to the attic. We interrupt their patrol by stealing a chess piece, which moves them to another part of the hallway. The voice in our head says that someone can help us in the library, but that the door is locked. We find the key in a room away from the main building, with a ghost spending time with their beloved limbless friend Rayman, and make our way back to the library. Once we enter the library, we find Patrick, and he gives us a key to the attic room. Why was he locked inside the library? Who locked him inside the library? Patrick is an interesting character because he essentially goes missing after this mission and we don't really see him again until the last cutscene of the game. I guess maybe he got locked in the library again. <laughs> Harry and the director have moved to a new chessboard that is right in front of the stairs to the attic. And I guess they're discussing that it's totally fair that Harry gets paid hundreds of thousands of pounds more than his co-workers because he's the mean one that does the handshake thing. Jade gets them to both move by calling the phone near the other chessboard from her bedroom. And I guess they have to go together because they're work besties. We go upstairs and find the attic room. Inside, we find a giant pile of Alexandra Letterman games and the present. As you run back, the spooky rocking horse will rock spookily. I love that. Once back at the party, we give Ginger her present. It's a portable CD player, which is already kind of dated for 2006. And it's also implied to be a gift from all four of us. Ginger is from North Dakota and her defining characteristic is that she doesn't feel good enough to be at the school. She's girly pop or whatever on the outside, but she loves shopping and music and dancing, but on the inside, she's deeply insecure about her abilities. Is this some kind of Euro commentary on American new money and ego? Something something game theory. Through incessantly pestering her in the lounge, we learn that her father was a rancher and that her mother was a psychologist. They all lived happily together on the ranch until factories were built close by, so they had to pack their bags and move away. Her father loved horses and Ginger did well at her riding lessons, so he wanted to buy her a horse so that she could go to equestrian college and live out his dream. Her mother was against buying a horse because, quote, it would cost their life savings and that that money should go towards her college tuition instead, which is a fair point. Her mother's wishes are rightfully ignored and Ginger gets a horse called Orishalcum. His name's never explained. Suddenly, her dad is now doing geological research at a nature reserve. I went back to see if I'd missed something, but no, her story just doesn't make any sense. His research gets co-opted by a shady businessman who wants to turn the land into a business development or oh, whatever. Ginger's dad takes the guy to court using his life savings again, and he wins, but the family is now bankrupt. This business guy runs off to France where he pulls the same scheme again, but gets found out by a young French woman who loves horses. Ooh. One day, Ginger overhears her parents fighting about money and threatening to sell Orishalcum, so she decides to run away to the circus. They appear to have a dandy time traveling with the circus for a bit until her parents somehow figure out where she is and they see her perform. 
After the show, they tell her that eh, they're rich again and they're living on a ranch, so she can come home and they can keep the horse. She comes back home with them, whether to a new ranch or the same ranch as before, I don't know, and all is well until, oh no, it isn't, and a factory nearby starts polluting the air and giving all the animals foot and mouth disease. Citation needed. Is foot and mouth disease airborne? I don't know. Orishaka <laughs> dies, and so do all the other animals at the ranch. So her parents are now bankrupt for the second time, third time, and have to move into a trailer park. So Ginger has come to Sycamore in the hopes of winning enough prize money to support her family, I guess. Ginger is also the main character of the DS version of the game. I don't understand why they didn't give her red hair, but then they made the main character of the game, who isn't called Ginger, have red hair. Why? <laughs> After Ginger's party, we progress through our timetable a little bit until Q challenges us to a race. Shockingly, Q's whole thing is that she's mean and only cares about good grades. She's also voiced by a white lady doing an accent. Welcome. I hope we do some first class work together. Yay! Even her being called Q feels offensive. Racism aside, Q is by far the best character. To call it character progression is perhaps a bit too generous, but she gets to be the most interesting character and she has some cute moments with Ginger later on. We win the race on the beach and Q tells us that the war is only just beginning. Esteban says that we should watch our backs because Q plans to be the best rider in the school no matter what. Q is from a rural village in northern China. Her family were farm workers and she grew up very poor. She always loved horses, but knew her family could never afford to keep one. One night, after walking back home from toiling the fields, she meets an ominous horse blocking her path. It takes a step towards her, and she takes this to mean that they're going to be BFFs. She calls the stallion Zay, which could mean thief or traitor, or the developers were just looking for another Asian-sounding syllable. Q knows that her family won't let her keep Zay, so she decides to ride across the border into Mongolia so she can live a nomadic lifestyle surrounded by horses. Okay, Queen. Sounds... Sounds like overkill to me, but you do you. After riding across the border, she gets taken in by a couple whose son has died from pneumonia. They communicate using symbols, and she becomes their surrogate daughter. What symbol would you use to communicate your child dying of pneumonia? Let me know in the comments! Q is insecure that she doesn't know as much about horses as the rest of her new community, so she becomes ultra competitive in order to prove herself. Her adoptive parents suggest that she should participate in the big race at the Nadam festival to win everyone over. Yeah, I said festival, what of it? Wikipedia tells me that horse racing at Nadam is only done by young children because it's more about the skill of the horse and not the rider, so they just want them to be as light as possible which we all learnt about from that episode of The Wild Thornberries. We never really find out how old these characters are supposed to be, aside from a cutscene that kind of implies maybe that they're hungover a bit later on, but that would mean that she's only like 15 or whatever when she's at the academy. I don't know, I'm giving this more thought than anyone needs to. If you're watching this video, you're the kind of person that cares about boring stuff like I do. Q and Zay train really hard for the festival, but her adoptive parents worry that she's kind of overworking herself a little bit. Cut to the race, everything is fine until Zay trips and falls. Q is injured during the accident and Zay has to be killed because his injuries are too severe. Luckily for Q, Harry was out there watching the race and scouting for talent, so he offers her a place at Sycamore. As that's exactly who you'd pick, the person that fell off and whose horse had to be killed. Why was Harry in Mongolia anyway? Was he trying to start a new spin-off so he could cheat on his wife again? Q confides in us that the only reason she's still competitive is that she actually wants to be beaten, but you can learn more from losing than you can from winning sometimes. And she must be a scholar by this point because she loses more than a something, something, something. At the end of the first week, grades permitting, we compete in a competition. Wow. I, I really wrote that. <laughs> Pull one out for Garby and Gerald Tiger, wherever they may be. Everyone celebrates our win, except for Q, who seethes about it to Spike and says some foreboding stuff forebodingly. The gang meets up with the director, and he tells us that we are to travel to the United States of America in order to learn how to communicate better with our horses, because America is famous for its pacifism. 
Ginger appears to be thrilled at coming back to her home country and treats us to a sick IMVU second life dance break on what appears to be multiple graves. Imagine paying all that money for your kid to study abroad and then they end up just going back home. <laughs> Jade tries to get closer to Esteban, but he doesn't say much. We learn that Jade has been horse riding for a long time and to be honest, that's kind of all the personality she gets. Jade's voice actor is the same woman who played Rose in the previous game. Her website lists her as having worked with Roman Polanski and Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> Nightmare blunt rotation is the kids say. <laughs> the US campus is amazing. They don't say where it's supposed to be and there's no theming that really says this is America. The Scotland part makes sense as like a kind of fantasy fictionalized Scotland with the rain and the brooding moors, but the American stuff seems to take place inside of a football stadium and then there's a blimp. It reminds me of when you're watching a K-drama and there'll be an American character that's obviously just a white European guy who's not even trying to disguise his like German accent. The new music for this area is impeccable as always. The director introduces us to our new horse communications instructor, Wendy. You know this woman has a lower back tattoo. Yeah, she's she's got she's got like dolphins going around her belly button, I'm gonna guess, and then she's got like a yin yang on her shoulder. She's not even an American character, so why did we come all this way to meet her? Why is she here? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to my lesson. This game is this game is so funny. Spike is a sex pest towards Wendy, but she seems to be into it. Now that we've met Wendy, we unlock a new activity for our timetable where we essentially just read our horse's mind. A horse will do something and we have to figure out what it means. For example, if our horse sways side to side, then obviously we need to give it some vitamin C. And if it tries to bite us, we punch it in the face. You can read about what these actions mean in the library, but there's no way to reference this or any notes you might have taken in your journal whilst you're doing the activity. The game also doesn't tell you the correct action either if you pick the wrong one, so the activity just kind of ends with you doing the wrong thing. We get to continue our activities for a little bit until Harry marches over to reprimand us for neglecting our horse in his stall. He drags us to our horse box and our horse is all stinky. Don't eat that, Mary. After we finish mucking out the stall, we find a cufflink in the straw and talk to Ginger about it. We tell her that we think someone is trying to get us kicked out of the competition. Ginger gaslights us and says, nobody would ever do that. We're all pals here. And then Q emerges to ask what we were talking about. The next day, we walk in on Ginger snooping around our horse box and our magnificent steed is missing. She says he was missing when she got here. So we go to confront Q because of course we do. Q says that we're pathetic because we are. And Esteban rushes in to say the director and Harry are coming to inspect the stables. The crew panics and we jump to the horse out in the American wilderness. The horse can also hear Elsie's Elise. So I guess something about the fire at the beginning both gave the horse and Jade the ability to hear voices. The voice tells the horse that we need to get back to the farm, um, school, I don't know what it is, before the timer runs out. Of course, we get back in one piece and the crew whoops with joy. We have another competition at the end of the week and Wendy says that she'll give Spike a special bonus. Again, I don't know how old we're supposed to be, but I assume it's fine. <laughs> Spike's story is kind of boring and it has too many mistakes to mean anything. Based on his look and his attitude, he's clearly supposed to be some kind of Johnny Rotten-esque figure and he calls Jade princess. But in the subtitles, he calls her Wombat, which it's giving Vegemite. It's giving beds are burning. It's giving Dame Edna. He's supposed to be a, a bad boy and a bit of a rebel, but he's played by the same guy that played Davy in the other game and he doesn't change his line delivery at all. Doesn't it bother you that I'm just a groom? Well, what could be more useful to me in a stud farm? Nice going, princess. Spike was born in Taiwan or India, depending on if you pay attention to the words being spoken or the subtitles. His parents were diplomats and he was raised by his aunt Abigail. She dies when he turns 16 and he gets sent to a fancy private boarding school. He gets bullied at the school by two kids called Rock and Hard Place and finds solace in writing poetry and playing guitar. He starts taking music lessons seriously when he develops a crush on the music teacher's daughter, Shirley. Shirley and Spike leave school to go to London and start a band. Shirley runs off with the drummer and Spike is sad. Much like Ginger's story, we take a huge jump forwards and now he's somewhere bad and runs into rock and hard place all grown up. Spike says that he's too busy 
quote, tying them to chairs with a special knot to hear the police arrive. So he gets arrested. His parents use their money to get him out of prison and they put him into a riding school owned by their friends. He channels his pain and misery into horse riding and gets offered a place at Sycamore because he's just so great. After winning the competition at the end of the week, we travel to Morocco for a competition against a rival riding academy. We are here at the request of Deborah, the director of this school, and she introduces us to her students. Our director, who we learn is called Birdie, tells us that this is an inter-school trial and governed by a code of honour. Now what does that mean? He says that we still need to win though, as that means we can take part in the Moroccan national competition later on. The competition structure in this game makes no sense whatsoever. And if anything, it makes less sense the more they try and explain it. Also, why would we be taking part in the national championship of a different country? That's like the whole point of it being national. One of the Moroccan students, who is also voiced by Spike slash Davy doing the same voice again, challenges Q to a swimming competition, and Jade uses this as an excuse to snoop in her room. The voice in our head tells us to go to the library again, and that the key is in Wendy's bag. We distract Wendy by making the poor cat we've been dragging around with us eat some food as she stares at it. Cat owners can relate, that is mostly what we do. The game even makes a joke about the library being locked again, as if they don't possess the ability to mm, write a different story. We find Harry keeping guard of Q's room, and he literally tells us to get back in the kitchen and make him a sandwich. Spike says he'll give us his sandwich if we return his library book for him. We return the book, give Harry the sandwich, and get to work snooping through Q's stuff. Q catches us pretty much immediately and reports us to the director. He confiscates all of our money, but doesn't kick us out of the school and says that we will be under constant surveillance until we can prove ourselves to be responsible and not just the absolute pits. Jade mopes to Esteban that the director didn't let us explain why we were being racist, but then she says that, eh, actually, I don't think it's Q after all, maybe it's Harry. Please note that her feet are on the pillow. Esteban's backstory is also kind of boring. He's from near Barcelona and his father was some kind of art collector, antiques trader, depop reseller. Esteban wanted to be a vet, but his father thought animals were a waste of time and wanted him to take over the family business. They become estranged until his father tries to win him back by buying a horse named Sol. Esteban is invited to join Sycamore, but he declines the offer because he doesn't want to leave his friends and family behind. Time passes and Esteban's father says that he wants to sell Sol because buying and selling is like his whole thing. Esteban is devastated and tries to get back into the academy so that he can run away. But, because he said no to the first invitation, he is now permanently banned from ever entering the school. He works with his father for a bit, but he can see that Esteban is depressed. To apologise for selling Sol, his father uses his Scottish network to get him into Sycamore again. Jay's all like, hmm, that sounds really bad, but I'm glad he got you in because I got to meet you. Jade and Ginger are tidying the library, and Ginger sees someone leaving Jade's stable on a motorbike. This game has two plot points, locked libraries and people entering or leaving buildings. We rush downstairs and the voice in our head tells us we have to chase down that motorbike. Now, if you've played the previous game, this is when your heart starts pounding and your vision starts clouding over. You set off at a gallop, astigmatism dialed up to 11. You've learned the shortcuts. You know how this goes. You're gaining on him, or are you? No matter how fast you gallop, the bike seems to get further and further away. You feel reality slipping away, your eyes glazing over and the light inside of you slowly fading. When did you save last? You accept that this is your life now, endlessly replaying this mission until you catch the guy on the quad bi I mean motorbike, history doomed to repeat itself. He reaches the gates long before you do. You brace yourself for the mission to begin again. Just kidding! You can't actually catch him. The game sets you up to fail, knowing that you would panic at another chase mission. Back at the school, Ginger and Esteban tell Jade that Spike hasn't been around much and we should keep a close eye on him. Jade takes a moment to apologise to Q for being a huge piece of sh** to her for no reason at all. Q says that she should have just asked her directly instead of snooping through her stuff, but she accepts the apology. Spike is still missing and the crew worry about whether or not he'll make it to the competition in time. On the eve of our honour-based inter-school competition, we see the director and Deborah having flirty banter on the roof. 
Deborah says that it's taken years to rebuild her reputation after he dragged it through the mud and she's going to destroy his blended family of clowns. We find out that they used to be married and he thinks that she's just bitter because he left her to start a new academy in Scotland. I guess they stay standing on the roof for the entire competition as we find them back up there after we win. The director says that she's let bitterness and hatred ruin her life and that the old Deborah was in it for the love of the horses and not winning. Deborah concedes and they share a drink under a terrifyingly close moon. Esteban gives Jade a rose and then we see Spike and Wendy. I'm just gonna play it. You tell me what you think happens next. As a palate cleanser, Ginger walks in on Q studying in the library and suggests that they revise together. Q is defensive and says everyone is mean to her until they need help with their studies. Ginger goes to walk away until we wake up in our bed, right side up this time, and Ginger tells us that the competition has been moved forwards a week. Jade is deep in her show jumping books in the library before the next competition, and Davy suggests that we do some cave exploring to de-stress. Wink. He brings her to the set of H2O and she's just loving it. She goes inside a quaint building and he locks the door behind her. Jade panics because registration for the competition closes soon and she needs to get back in time to sign up. Can't relate to that, can't identify, terrible planning. <laughs> the horse pulls the door open and we're able to escape. We race back to the school and register in time. Jade confronts the student and accuses him of being the person who's been trying to sabotage her all along because I guess he was hiding in the bushes with Harry at the beginning. <laughs> he says that all will be revealed if Jade is able to beat him in a race. I hope the people living in these houses don't mind that people are just constantly galloping past their house at all hours. Imagine stepping out of your front door and just getting completely annihilated by a horse galloping by. Sign me up. <laughs> After we win, the student explains that he's jealous of Spike's relationship with Wendy, so Deborah told him to get revenge. How trapping us in a cave is getting back at Spike, we'll never know. Jade teases Spike about hooking up with Wendy, as if it's not been clear as day that these guys are just May Decembering all over the shop. We win the Moroccan National Championships, and the director says that we need to travel back to Scotland for even more training. This will be the penultimate competition before the World Championship, so we gotta get our sh together. That means you, Gerald Tiger. During this debriefing, Q notices that Ginger is missing. We train in Scotland for a bit on some new courses until Esteban's horse mysteriously falls ill. We fetch the vet, who's had a little trip to Epion since we've seen him last. Did anyone else have a crush on the fetch the vet guy? No, just me. <laughs> we all meet with the director, except for Ginger, who's still missing. I hope we didn't leave her in Morocco. And says that Esteban's horse has been poisoned. Dun, dun, dun. He lets us know that the poison came from this file and that this file was found in Jade's room. Jade proclaims her innocence, saying that she's never seen this file in her life and that someone has been out to get her eliminated from the competition from day one, but it's all too late. Considering the racial profiling of a fellow student, breaking and entering, and now poisoning an animal, Jade is asked to leave the academy. JK, no, she just gets told off again because that seems to be working so well. Since it served her so well before, Jade decides that she's going to snoop in Ginger's room this time. This isn't even a puzzle, you just have to run past Wendy. Wendy really needs to get her eyes checked, damn. Once inside Ginger's room, we read her diary, filled with her innermost thoughts and fears. Tonight, Spike made this throwaway comment while I was eating a bag of crisps. Nah, we decide it's not her. Ginger confronts the group and apologizes for being distant. You think they'd mention something about her family or money troubles, but no, she's just got seasonal affective disorder. We take part in the competition. This time it's zhuzhed up to look a bit more legit, which is kind of cute. After the win, Q pulls a basic instinct on Ginger and talks about how she'll have to go back to her family when the competition is over. Ginger asks if she'll ever see Q again and that she was hoping maybe they could get an apartment together when they leave the academy. Q says they'll find a way, and they pinky promise to stay in touch. Then they put their pinkies inside there. The director tells us this is the first time Sycamore has ever gotten to the World Championship qualifiers, and then gives us an up yours for some reason. We offer him a single cheer. Wah! Esteban and Jade sit precariously atop a cliff face, and he confesses his love for her. 
He was pretty upset earlier that we seem to have almost killed his horse, but I guess it's fine now. He says nothing will ever separate them, and they sit in awkward silence for quite a long time. We're back at France's idea of America again for the World Championship qualifiers. This time we have to compete midweek, and the director is so stressed that he briefly turns French. Mademoiselle, il est temps. À vous jouer. As soon as we start moving, something seems off. This course could be called what it feels like to eat more than 10 Skittles as an adult, or anemic girly simulator. We ride the course for an excruciating four minutes, take a second to hurl, and then run to Esteban to tell him that we've been chosen to compete in the World Championship. Almost immediately, a policeman, all the way from Scotland, tells us that our horse has tested positive during a drug test. We proclaim our innocence for the hundredth time, but get taken into custody regardless, aka the school library. Book! Is it even worth asking why a doped horse would make our vision blurry? Esteban comes to visit us in the pokey for a quick conjugal visit. He's wearing an ominous black shirt with one sleeve rolled up, but I'm sure it means nothing. Jade pleads to Esteban that she would never do anything wrong, aside from being a big old racist snoop, and he says that surely they'll find the true culprit soon enough. We entrust our horse to Esteban and say he must ride him during the championship because he's worked so hard. The horse, not Esteban. No, 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 no. Hello, um, it's the fun police. Um, wouldn't the horse be banned from the competition too? Jade catches herself before she says the L word to Esteban and deflects by making fun of his dumb new shirt. It's the English way to deflect sincerity by making fun of someone. <laughs> he tells her that he just had to roll a sleeve up because he lost a cuff link. Link, link, link. Jade puts two and two together and actually gets four this time and realizes that it's been Esteban all along. He's the only person she hasn't suspected yet, so she would have got to him eventually, I guess. I do enjoy that they had to put the cufflink twist at the end, because it would have been too obvious for him to change his shirt immediately after we found it. The subtitles say button, which makes more sense, because like, if you lose a cufflink, you can still use your shirt. <laughs> Get out of the room, fun police. <laughs> Wool finally lifted from her eyes, Jade is tasked with escaping from the library. She climbs out of the window onto the roof, and the voice in her head says that we can find a key to Esteban's room in the director's safe. This is the first time that we get to explore the US campus, and it's this like, trendy modern loft kind of thing. All of the environments in this game are really nicely done, and it feels like they're trying to show that they do know how to make a visually pleasing game, it's just horses are kind of difficult. We run around aimlessly until we find the other students, and they each give us a clue as to what the code for the safe is. One, does the director have keys to all of our rooms? Two, why do the students know the code for the safe? Three, if the students know the code to the safe, just tell me, man. One of the clues is that the number is a palindrome. It's not relevant outside of this, but each week we get a new postcard from this Emma Chamberlain looking mother <laughs> called Julie. She's a friend of Jade's and tells us stuff about her incredibly dull life. And this week's postcard said that she just learnt what a palindrome is and explains the concept to us. This is great because in a previous postcard, Julie told us that she wants to become the world's best mathematician. A choice made so presumably it doesn't seem odd for her to randomly tell us what a palindrome is. But this also means that she didn't know what a palindrome was before dedicating her higher studies to the pursuit of mathematical knowledge. And why is she sending us a postcard when we're the one that's traveling the world? We open the safe, we get into Esteban's room, complete with a TV mounted to a glass wall and the worst place basketball net in human history, and find his evil villain Merce. We showed the police and the director a poison order form we found in his room and the cufflink from our stable. The teacup pig says, damn, why would he do that though? And asks Esteban to spill the beans. Esteban confesses to trying to sabotage Jade in order to get his horse back. That horse was supposed to be his before Jade waddled in and rescued it from a fire. He wanted to get her expelled so that he would be able to ride the horse again and win the championships to get to the Olympics. He poisoned his own horse in order to get suspicion off of him, and he knew it wasn't enough to cause any lasting damage. The game doesn't say it, but I assume his vet knowledge made it so he would know where to find horse uppers. The director scolds him for, like, completely missing the point of the whole school, and we get some intimate partner violence. The director says that 
all horses are wonderful, talented angel babies, and it's the skill of the rider that's important. Any horse can become a champion if your connection is strong enough. Try telling that to the 800-year-old riding school Shetland Pony mix that eats children for breakfast. We go back to training as if nothing happened, and presumably we're both cleared to take part in the World Championship. Worlds are finally upon us, and this time we get to ride in a crazy blinged out arena with these cool giant horse statues. I really wish the game worked properly so we could actually see what was going on here. I like that the front row seats are completely empty. <laughs> Gerald Tiger starts off okay, but he gets eliminated in the cross country. He Roxy Andrewed his entire way through the competition, and you have to applaud that. This competition is actually a bit harder, but not really. <laughs> We win, naturally, with Q and Ginger coming second and third respectively. Pippa Sally awards us our trophies, and someone finally decides to let Patrick out of the library. The camera pans out and we see Esteban seething from the sidelines, as I guess he's the one ethnic man the United States isn't desperately trying to incarcerate. We get a brief post credit scene where Jay seems to poke a horse in the eye, and then the game ends. <laughs> That's it! We did it! Yay! We did it, it's all over. Does the plot make sense? No. Am I really surprised that they made dragging the horse a plot point? Yes. <laughs> Did I have fun? Arguable. <laughs> the next game in the series takes a sharper turn towards being a straight up puzzle game, and it's clear that the developers realise that there's not much fun meat on these bones if you don't switch up the format a little bit. Fun meat on the horse bones. If you haven't played any of these games before, I don't think I'd recommend playing any of them at all. But if you still have your old copy, boot it up. Give it a go. Let your soul be cleansed by the Trey 2000s character design and remember what it was like to be young and happy. Bye. When you're online shopping, the websites are controlled by this entity called Shumi. There's books in the library that explain that Shumi first appeared in August of 1999 during a magnetic upsurge that affected computers worldwide and that it's some kind of sentient trickster anime waifu who just hangs out on the internet for you to talk to. They credit the lead developer as having written this, so I don't know if that says something about his innermost wishes. Is accusing someone of wanting a waifu libelous? <laughs>